welcome to Wednesday nights where we rope you in because the previous Wednesdays looked like we were practicing social distancing up in here <laughs> and that ain't happening. So get used to it. Get to know your neighbor. Take a little bit more time in the weeks ahead for the meet and greet, right? Because typically those of us in here that have a Baptist background, you sit in the same seat every week, which means you meet the same person every week. And we really want to see you get to know other people. So we wanted to carve out at least a minute, right? Turn and meet your neighbor. Go up the aisle, meet the person in the back row, introduce yourself, come back, find your seat. There'll be plenty of time. Agreed? All right. My name is Matthew Mayer. I'm one of the ministers here. It's awesome to see you guys joining us on a Wednesday night. This is our third installment in our book study of Psalms, the book of Psalms. So if you have your Bibles, I don't want to waste any more time. I would love for you to turn to Psalm chapter three. It's eight verses in whole. It's a very powerful Psalm because it's very personal, powerful, personal and we're going to talk about the context, the background behind why David wrote it, when he wrote it. And of course, you're going to see a pattern that is very consistent in the book of Psalms. Seems to be that there is a plight that the psalmist is navigating, he's dealing with. It's a trial, it's a pressure, a hardship. And of course, he turns to God. He asks questions. In the middle of the psalm or towards the end of the psalm, you'll see that God provides his peace to the psalmist, and he ends with a form of praise. We're going to see a very similar outline in Psalm 3, and I love that you're taking notes or at least taking mental note. Here's my outline up front. Eight verses. We break the eight verses into four stanzas. The four stanzas, of course, are made up of two verses each. Verse 1 and 2 with one word, peril peril. Verses three to four, prayer. In response to the peril, David is going to offer a prayer. In verses five and six, God responds and gives David his peace, his peace, peril, prayer, peace. And verse seven and eight, you're going to see promise. God keeps his promises. This amazing psalm, of course, has a very similar feel to Psalm 2. If you were with us last Wednesday, you, of course, journeyed in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people conspire or meditate or plot a vain thing? Categorically, kings, judges, rulers, taken counsel together, their chief aim against the Lord and his anointed. What's their beef with God? They wanted to break free from his bonds. They wanted to rebel against his commandments, his cords. And of course, God laughs. He sits in the heavens. He's sovereign. He is God. He's already installed his king on his holy hill in Zion. Of course, when you keep reading, you see regardless of man's attempt at rebellion, God puts it down and obviously already has his king in place. This is the Christian faith. Our God in Christ is king of kings. There is no sweat on his brow, nor should there be sweat on our brow. We can be at peace, but it's a journey. As we'll see, from Psalm 2 to Psalm 3, we go from rebellion against the Redeemer to a rebellion against the redeemed. And this is where it's personal. Your Bible should have what is called a superscript over top the psalm. That was not the Bible publisher's edition or commentary expressing or explaining the psalm. That wasn't added after the fact. In fact, this is one of the few psalms that actually the original manuscript 
David wrote it in himself or somebody that transcribed what he wrote, which is a song or a poem, documented the why behind the psalm, the reason. What's the reason David wrote this psalm? We don't always have access to that. Sometimes Bible scholars are able to say, that that psalm was written during that period and here were the circumstances. But a lot of the times we're just kind of guessing. This, this superscript, man, it took me on a journey. In fact, I hope not to share all the details that I learned or at least remembered from my studies in the book of 2 Samuel involving David and his lineage and his family and, according to the superscript, his one son, Absalom. So here's the superscript, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Now, on your own time, here's what you need to do. You need to go back into the Old Testament, go to 2 Samuel, and just read. Chapters 15 to 18 will really help frame the context behind Psalm 3. And there's so many details. And again, I, I don't plan on sharing them all, but just to bring you up to speed, here's what happened. Now, there's a story behind the story. And then there's a story behind the story that's behind the story. I know, it's very deep and it's very multi-layered, just like your life. Just like things in your history triggered or were catalysts to things that happened in your story. In David's life, what we see in his story, his testimony, is that there were things that happened in his history There was dysfunction in his family that was, let's say, brewing underneath the surface. And at a certain point, Absalom, one of his sons, begins to see a moment that he can seize. And what he wanted of his father at this point was the kingdom. And Absalom was going to plan an insurrection and rebel against his own father and of course, attempt to take the throne in Jerusalem. Well, why would he do that? Well, it begins with David's children. David's firstborn son was a man named Amnon. Amnon had a half-sister named Tamar. Amnon, the Bible says he really loved her, was obsessed with her, but we discover it was lust. He lusted after his half-sister, He put in place a plot to eventually take her by force and rape her. So Amnon sexually assaults and rapes his sister Tamar. When that happened, the Bible does tell us that David was angry, but it also tells us he didn't do anything. The father did not deal with the dysfunction of his own son. No, but Absalom, who was the sibling or brother to Tamar, he did. But he waited two years, two years to deal with what his brother did to his sister. Had a party, got him drunk, and then ordered his servants, Absalom did, to kill his half-brother, Amnon. What happened then? Absalom flees. And for the next three years, he's in hiding. He's on the run. It actually tells us that David wanted to go see him, but he didn't. So not only did he not deal with, get this, Tamar's rape from his son Amnon, and then Absalom killing his brother and David's son, and then fleeing, and for three years on the run, eventually David's general brought Absalom back to the kingdom, where David still did not want to see his boy. In fact, he put him in a different estate. For the next two years, David did not see his son face to face. And even when he eventually was ordered to come back and they met, you could almost see it wasn't true reconciliation. Translation, there was dysfunction in the family. And the culmination of this dysfunction, whatever it was in Absalom that resented his father, caused him in the beginning of chapter 15 in 2 Samuel to post up in the gates of the city. That was the common place for elders or the nobility or sometimes the king where he would meet the people. Well, Absalom would meet the people there and he would receive their 
complaints or concerns about the kingdom. And he would say, oh yeah, they're too busy. The system is so clogged, they'll never hear your grievances. But if I was in power, and he offered a a hope to the people at the time, the Bible actually says that the heart of Israel fell in love with Absalom. So you can almost feel the insurrection is brewing. Eventually, Absalom announced to his father, David, that he wanted to go to Hebron. Everybody that was part of David's court at this time knew what was happening and were warning David to put it down, but he couldn't. And eventually, Absalom, with an army, many of which were part of David's army, many of the friends and associates of David and the family turned on him and went with Absalom. So picture this, as David is fleeing Jerusalem, Absalom is coming into Jerusalem to proclaim himself king. This is kind of the background behind Psalm 3. Now, here's what I wanna make very personal for all of us. I wanna answer some questions. Why do things like this happen? Betrayal, false accusation, suffering, Why is there pain? Why is there hardships? Why is there conflict? Why do people backstab? Why all these tragedies? Why is there friction and tension in marriages? Why are families falling apart? Like, I wanna answer that question with the Bible. The first thing you need to note, as a fallen human in a fallen world, is that part of the fall is that things fall apart. There you have it, there's some theology for you. Why is all this happening? Why betrayal? Why suffering? Part of the fall is things fall apart. There's one of your answers, right? And a lot of times we wrestle with these things of life and we might not get the actual answer, but here's one of them. Because we are sinful and sin brings consequences, whether my own sin brings consequences, as in the case of David, and we'll see what I mean by that in a second, or somebody else's sin brings consequences. Another reason this was happening, if you go back with me a little bit before the context of Absalom and Tamar and Amnon, something David did that was very displeasing to God. Now, please note, David is identified and called by God himself as a man after his own heart. Really encouraging considering we're made of the same stuff as David. And all of us, if we're being honest, we have fallen short. We have made mistakes. We have failed largely. And there are consequences. But God does not forsake us. And he's after the heart. And because he's after the heart, David being a man after God's heart, it meant that when he made a mistake, And yet he may have covered it up for a season when it was exposed, when it was brought to the light. He pursued repentance. He was a man who went after God's heart. And on that one fatal, faithful night, David saw someone who was not his wife and he decided to take her unto himself. Her name's Bathsheba. Bible students, we know this account. Took her slept with her, discovered she was pregnant, attempted to cover up this affair, this adultery, by summoning her husband. His name was Uriah the Hittite. What a noble man in scripture. He comes and he's unwilling to lay with his wife, even though the king is commanding him to enjoy his wife for the night. He's saying, I can't lay with her tonight. If my men are out on the battlefield suffering, What does that make me if I'm able to come and lay with my wife? And he doesn't do it. David realizes he's not gonna be able to deceive. So he orders Uriah to be sent to the front lines. You know this story, right? And he's killed. David thinks he covers it up. We never cover it up. God sees. God sends his word through the prophet Nathan Did you know one of the consequences of that sin 
comes to us in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11. It says, thus says the Lord. You ready for this? Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. This is God speaking of the consequences of David's sin. I will raise up adversity from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. And that actually happened. One of the first things Absalom did when he came into Jerusalem, he was advised to lay with David's concubines, which was a slap in the face. It was disgraceful. And that, of course, was predicted as a consequence of this man's sin. We know that the baby that was born to Bathsheba and David, the Lord took. But did you know that Bathsheba and David also had a second son? Did you know his name was Solomon? Do you know Solomon is the Hebrew word for peace, shalom? Do you know that regardless of his failure and his sin and the consequences that fell, do you know that Solomon between David and Bathsheba is like God giving them peace because Psalm 51, which we'll get to in 2051, (laughs) is the Psalm of repentance that David penned after he was humbled. I love that. You wanna know why? Because though I just got done telling you, part of the fall is that things fall apart. You ready for this? Part of redemption is that what falls apart still plays a part in the beautification of being set apart. And it's on the screen so you can read it. Part of redemption is that what falls apart plays a part in the beautification or sanctification of you and I being set apart. I love that because God will take it all, good, bad, and ugly, and he will use it and work in you a divine work that he couldn't do otherwise. God is still doing a work regardless of what's happening in your present life right now. Okay? His redemptive work is at work. Here's your responsibility. Here's my responsibility. Like David, things are seemingly falling apart. His own son is kicking him out of the kingdom and proclaiming himself king. I don't know what that's like. Not sure if you know what that's like, having a child or a family member betray you in such a way. And yet, David's decision, he could be reactive or he could be redemptive. And I think that's really the only two choices we have. Because right now you're going through something, each of us. And in the midst of it, you can be reactive and you can meet whatever it is that's happening with the same force, or you can be redemptive. And I believe Psalm 3, I believe it with all my heart, Psalm 3 is an answer to somebody's prayer tonight on how should I be responding. Let's read Psalm 3, verse 1 and 2. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Now stop, from David's perspective, as he's making his way out of Jerusalem, he's aware that his enemies are increasing. He's aware that the forces that are against him, they seem to be snowballing. They're getting larger. He's not magnifying a problem. He has a very large problem on his hands but he stops and somewhere on the journey, he writes this Psalm. You know why I love it? Because as I'm looking at it, I recognize the enemy's coming in like a flood. And yet instead of bringing his complaint to a human agent, he finds the time to bring his complaint to a divine agent. Did you get that church? Because you know how easy it is? And there's a time and a place to confide in and find counsel in and lean on human agencies. It's what the body of Christ is all about. We'll never stop leaning in to the body of Christ. But we have to have the discernment to know whenever that thing is happening around me, I have to eventually bring it to the heavens above me. 
So David brings his concerns in a very real way. Listen to the language. How they've increased to trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Hear me. It's one thing to have all these dynamics and circumstances in your own family happening. Your son, your friends, your marriage, your children are wayward. It's one thing for all that to be happening and navigate it. It's an entirely weightier thing. If you begin to believe and are convinced by the critics and the naysayers that are saying of your circumstances, not even God can help him get out of this one. Because it don't matter what they're saying. It doesn't matter what's happening. You have to keep your faith in God. There's never a situation that is beyond redemption. There's not a single circumstance that God cannot move in and through. And I'm here to tell you, regardless of what it feels like, regardless of what it looks like, regardless of all of that happening, don't you dare believe that enemy's voice that says to you, there is no help for him from God. Amen. You know, when David was making his way out, they were weeping. As he's leaving Jerusalem, a guy named Shimei, 2 Samuel 16, 7 and 8. And Shimei said thus, when he saw David, he cursed. Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul. Shimei was of the Benjamites. So he's related to King Saul, the previous king, whom God removed and installed his king, David. Shimei is saying to David, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue, the Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. To make matters worse, this is one of the perfect times where you say, this is adding insult to injury. Did you know that David's men who stayed with him, they look at their ruler, their leader, and like, yo, are you going to let him talk to you like that? They were ready to pounce on Shimei. And David, you got to read it for yourself. I'm summarizing. He says, no, perhaps God has ordered him to say that to me. Translation, perhaps he's right. David had a proper estimation of self. He then said, perhaps God will turn this into a blessing. One day, perhaps his cursing, God will have mercy on me and turn his cursing into a blessing. So here's where I stop, because there are things that are gonna be said of you. There are people who are gonna come against you. There's gonna be accusation hurled at you. Misjudgments at you. And from the Psalm, I see this. Many are they. And many are they who say whatever they want to say. But when you know Bible, you know God has the final say. Many are they, and many are they who say whatever it is they want to say. Translation, let them say what they're going to say. But you believe your God has the final say. You know how this plays out? Eventually, David's army puts down the rebellion He's able to go back into Jerusalem because he trusted God for the outcome. He comes back into Jerusalem and guess who's waiting for him? Shimei. You know what Shimei says? Now Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king when he had crossed the Jordan. Then he said to the king, do not let my Lord impute iniquity to me or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my Lord, the king, left Jerusalem, that the king should take it to heart. For I, your servant, know that I have sinned. Therefore, here I am, the first to come today of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord, the king. You know what's crazy is David could have responded on that day, could have re reacted is the word I'm using, but he chose to be redemptive, not reactive. Are you seeing the outcome of this? 
David, of course, his same men were like, yo, David, let's take him out now. And he says, no. And he made an oath to Shimei and said, I will not touch you. But if you know your Bible, you know exactly what happened on David's deathbed. David told Solomon, hey, remember Shimei? Take him out. Now, when you know your history, you understand Shimei was a problem to David's eventual reign. And there was something else going on behind the scenes. But I digress. The reason I bring that up is because, man, I can relate to this. I can relate this in, in, in a, such an intimate way. I've had people say things to me, whether they were right or wrong, and in a moment wanting to respond and defend myself or defend my family or defend my wife, biting my tongue. Some would say swallowing my pride. I say spitting out my pride. One recent testimonial, somebody that was constantly through the years showing up on my social media, writing some really vicious things about me, using some of the terminology about I'm a bloodthirsty man, translation, I'm a murderer. Basically saying God's not pleased with me. Similar language. You have no idea how your pastor wanted to reply and respond and perhaps meet that force with the same force. Recently, that same individual reached out, said, I've been watching from a distance through the years. I wanted to apologize to you for the things I said. Sounds like the Lord got a hold of his heart or his life. He's been watching the messages, misjudged you, thought you would have given up the script that you've been on for the past however long. You know what I'm saying, what I'm saying? And I was like, Lord, you are so good. When we don't fight these battles, we let him handle it. It might not happen in our timeline, which is why what you read at the end of verse two, there's a lot of debate on what it means and even how to translate it. Some say selah, some say selah. Either or, it's a Hebrew note. It could be a pause. Most people agree that it's a musical pause because these are Psalms. And the reason why that is so imperative and so important is because think about what he just said. All these things are happening around me. All these forces are against me. All my critics are saying, not even God can get you out of this one. And as he's recalling the complaints against him, but he's bringing them to heaven, he adds, pause. I don't know about you, but it might not be the best place to pause. And sometimes life's happening and we don't leave any room for the pause. Because a lot of times the pause is an interruption. A lot of times the pause is an inconvenience. But can I tell you something about music? The music, the psalm, may be interrupted by a pause but the pause is still an intricate part of the music. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes God will put a pause, sideline, because he wants your attention. I've heard people talk about an ailment they received, a sickness that sidelined them, it slowed them down. And they were moving quick and God used it as a means to put a pause to speak to them or to get them to speak to him. Without the pause, I don't think we would get to verse three and four. Without the pause and David contemplating what it is that's happening to him and against him, I don't think that verse three and four would be the response. Watch. Here's my complaints. Here's my concerns. You see it. People are saying that you're not gonna help me. Watch verse three and four. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. Pause. Let that sink in. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield. He's not asking the Lord to be a shield. He is 
saying you are a shield. What do we know of a shield? A shield is a, a weaponry of protection. Notice a shield can also absorb arrows or whatever it is the enemy is using to get at the person behind the shield. The Lord is our shield. It's likely that David would have pulled this idea from Genesis 15, the ancient writings in the Torah. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. The word shield, it shows up in Psalm 512, Psalm 182, Psalm 1830, Psalm 1835, Psalm 28, 7, Psalm 33, 20. It's a consistent theme of the Psalms that God is a shield. He's a strength. He's a help. He's a protector. David says, he's my glory. Think of the king in all of his splendor, all his fame, all of his might. And here he's on his way out of that, not sure if he'll ever have that back. And he's recognizing even in the midst of his lowest point that God was his glory. And I think there's a valuable lesson for that for us as well. He's my shield. He protects me. He's my glory. He's the one that lifts up my head. That's countenance talk. Sometimes Somebody doesn't even have to tell you that they're going through something. It's their countenance. This posture of the head being down is one of defeat. And he, David has every reason to have his head down. And yet he's recognizing it's the Lord that lifts up his head. It's the Lord that strengthens his spine. He cries out to the Lord with his voice. When's the last time you cried out to the Lord? He makes reference that the Lord hears him from a certain location. Don't miss this. Where did he hear him from? My holy hill. Remember Psalm 2? My holy hill of Zion. He's talking of Jerusalem, the very place that he's leaving, that he's fleeing from the presence of his son who is establishing his own Thrown in Jerusalem, David's like, it doesn't matter who is on that throne in Jerusalem, that throne, that holy hill is yours. Here's what I wrote down. David had fled Jerusalem seemingly as a disgraced king. Absalom had commandeered Jerusalem seemingly as the new great king. Yet the Lord was still occupying his holy hill as the only king. I guess it's appropriate to say at this particular point, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. You understand what I'm saying, church? Your God is still on his throne and he's in complete control. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, it is the shield of faith that serves as a fortress. Ladies and gentlemen, lift up that shield of faith. The shield of faith is faith in Christ. Lift up your faith as a shield, your belief in Christ, and know that he is your protector. What's the result of a faith like this? Well, verse five and six, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. I want you to really taste this. He's leaving Jerusalem. He's leaving his palace. He's leaving behind everything that he had. To make matters worse, it's his own son that is spearheading the rebellion. He's going into the Mount of Olives, the wilderness likely finding a cave. He, he takes the time to write a song. He recognizes the peril of what's happening. Instead of being reactive, he's redemptive. He prays. He believes his prayers. So much so 
that however he laid his head down, whether on a rock, whether on a bed of leaves, he tells us, I slept. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When something's going on in your life and how hard it is to sleep? How hard it is to get your mind to shut off? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And a lot of times, because we can't sleep, we allow outside influences to help us. Listen to me. I'm not telling you to try to count sheep. I'm telling you to be a sheep and let the shepherd take care of your needs. You understand what I'm saying? Big difference? I know it's hard. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, I've had me some restless nights not knowing the outcome of a circumstance or a situation. And it keeps your mind going all night. And the next day you wake up and because you didn't get the rest, that sleep intended for you, you already know your mind is foggy. And here David's like, I slept soundly. I awoke because the Lord sustained me. Can I tell you something? That God's peace is a pillow. With it, we rest. Without it, we rust. Did you know that I slept like a... Why do we say sleep like a baby? I used to say that before I was a dad. What the? Baby ain't sleeping? I slept rather well at peace in prison. I don't think I ever had better sleep. Oh, I didn't have a sleep number bed. The mattress was an inch and a half thick. Uh, you were lucky if you had a pillow. And if you had a pillow, it was plastic. Oh, by the way, I wasn't in a cell. I was in a dormitory setting with 37 other inmates. No dividing walls. And yet somehow, by God's grace, believing he was my shield, trusting him, I was able to lay down and sleep. Slept better in prison than I do in my own house now. Now, granted, I have night crawlers that wake up in the middle of the night and, and come in my room, but I guess that's better than inmates coming into my area. But it was God's peace as my pillow. And with his peace, regardless of what's happening, you will rest. And you can rest knowing that he will never stop working on your behalf. Without his peace, you will rust. You will erode. You will fall apart. But also notice something with me. It says, verse 6, he makes a proclamation. It tells us he woke up. And verse 6, he's got a renewed sense of confidence. He's got a newfound faith. He wakes up with a new sense of strength. It doesn't matter if there's 10,000 people that are waiting right now to kill me. Why? Well, when you know God stands with you, it doesn't matter who stands against you. That's why. That's a New Testament promise. Romans 8.31. What then shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Christian, you need to hold on to this promise. Listen, I have the very unique vantage point. When I teach and I get to see faces and families that I know intimately, and I know some of the things you are navigating and going through, and I'm teaching the living word of God, and personally, I want you to hold on to what I'm saying because I know it's true. And I want you to know that this same God that sees David in the midst of great peril is the same God that sees you in what you're going through. Verse seven then, and verse eight, if it's a chain, begins with peril in verse one and two, prayer in verse three and four, peace in verse five and six, and now promise in verse seven and eight. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, 
For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. Again, this is very familiar language. David likely also pulled this from Numbers chapter 10, verse 35. It was a, an anthem that Moses and the children of Israel would proclaim or declare on their journey through the wilderness from Egypt and bondage to the promised land. And every time they would break camp, now remember when they would break camp, it was because they were following the Lord's lead. They were following him by day with what? Who knows their Bible? A cloud. And at night, a pillar of fire. But before they would break camp, Numbers 10, 35. So it was whenever the ark set out that Moses said, rise up, Lord. Let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. I don't know if there's a better way to start your day. Arise, O Lord. Go before me, O Lord, today. Regardless of what's waiting for me at work. Regardless of what's waiting for me at home. Regardless. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. Now, before I tease this out, this is a mirror of the uprising and the mocking from verse one and two, but it's inversed. Listen to this, watch this. Verse one, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say there is no salvation for him in God. Verse seven inverses that while the enemy is rising up and saying to him, God can't save you. David is take, this is what I love. David's taking what the enemy is saying and doing and he is just using it and reversing it and giving it to God. So the next time somebody is doing something against you, saying something about you, take what they're saying and just tell God to counteract it. You don't counteract it. You just take what they're saying and you say, God, you arise. You save. Why the cheekbone? You ever got struck on your cheekbone? The right pressure point. Your cheekbone is both connected to your eye socket and your jaw. The strike on the cheekbone would both affect the vision and the ability to speak. David is saying, make what they see blurry and cause what they're saying to stop because salvation belongs to you, the Lord, your blessing upon your people. What I love about David's heart is that he's not asking for the blessing to be upon him. He's actually asking for God to intervene, knowing that it would be a blessing for all the people. There's a huge difference between a person who is only praying for God to get them out of it versus, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, versus the person that's saying, Lord, make much of yourself through this. Bless my family for generations to come through this. Is this making sense? Sometimes I go back into my old writings, journals from incarceration and just to see where I was. And I found one and I copy and pasted it. I was like, wow, this is such a good way to end. So I'm just going to read what I wrote years ago. There is absolutely, absolutely no place or circumstance better than where you are currently when you're in the center of God's will. Whether God placed you where you are or allowed you to be where you are, he would have not brought you to it unless he intended to bring you through it and teach you a divine lesson from it. You see, the safest place to be is that which has been appointed by the Lord and the safest steps to take are those 
ordered by the Lord. Again, regardless of our perspective and the surroundings that we see, when in God's loving hands, there is no safer place to be. But we have to commit ourselves to those loving hands. Eight verses, Psalm chapter three. Very personal, very intimate struggles. The background, the story behind the story has a story behind that story. Yes, this was consequential from the way David chose to disobey God. But that did not stop him, regardless of what he brought to the table. This is so important. A lot of, let me say this. A lot of the times we think our decisions, which may have led us into a circumstance, because we are the reason we're in that circumstance, you know what? Well, woe is me. I deserve what's happening. No! God says, I don't care how you got there. What I care about is whether or not you're gonna let me come join you where you are so I can be the one that takes, ready for it, all the cliches that I believe with all my heart, take your mess and make it a message. Take your tragedy and make it triumphant. Take your ugly and make it beauty. Or like David, turning an assault into a psalm, turning a wrong into a song. Translation, he allowed God to be God. Simple. He allowed God. God, to be God. Listen, I know there is, I know there's a lot of hardship in this room and those that are watching online, because that's life. Part of the fall is that things fall apart. But I also know our God, because of his redemption, he takes those things that are falling apart, he uses them to play their part, to make me more like himself because I'm set apart. Doesn't make it easier, but with the peace of God, as my fortress, if he's my shield, he's covering me. At least maybe tonight, I'm gonna lay my head down and I'm gonna sleep. And I'm gonna wake up tomorrow morning knowing that the Lord sustained me. And I'm going to proclaim, regardless of what's happening to me, around me, against me, arise, O oh Lord, save my God. I know for a fact that if you're navigating a tragedy right now, a burden, there will be people here that want to pray with you. They want to help actualize this psalm tonight. Right here at the front. I know a lot of people go that way. I would love to see the day, Pastor Terrence, where a lot of people come this way, where ministry happens, right? The sermon went forth, and now I'm gonna actually take what I just heard, and I'm gonna commit it to prayer to God. And each of us have like a fingerprint, very unique circumstances. Don't, don't leave. Don't leave tonight without taking God at his word. Final things I'm gonna say, he sees you, he loves you. His plan for your life is perfect. It takes all those things that are considered ugly and messy and he's able to take it and bring something beautiful from it. And yeah, you might be a long ways off from that there's a leadership principle that we often share. And if you spiritualize it, it'll make more sense than ever. That you begin with the end in mind. Now, if I know my God is able to redeem, I might not see it in the immediate future, but I'm gonna begin believing him with that end in mind. So let's end with prayer. If the Lord is 
laying something on your heart tonight, we'll meet you up here. This is what church does. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, the one that David relied on, the Messiah, the one that he cried out to, the one that joined him and gave him peace, your son. So we're asking in his name, in his power, that you would minister to these people before me. Lord, that you would begin to heal hearts tonight that may be bruised, wounded. That you would begin to infuse hope back into perspectives tonight. People that are down and out and downcast. Lord, that you would grant your peace to many tonight who have been wrestling, who have been sleepless. Give them your peace. Just grant them your comfort. Let them know that you're in control. Thank you for the testimony of scripture. Your word says we can learn of the things of old, even the plight and peril of David, how you restored him to his throne because he trusted you. So I pray Psalm 3 tonight comes to life. Thank you for blessing us above what we deserve. Thank you for speaking through your servant. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.